to the second part of the tutorial. Good. All right. Um, just a reminder, we are talking about deductive synthesis for a low-level program to those program equators, and we want to make them flow with right? That's that's what's fine. And so in the first part on Monday. Um, we have seen mostly how to describe programs using this formula and configuration logic, right? Um, and we have seen our system source like actually being able to generate programs from those uh, specifications. But um, today we will look a little bit more under the hood of the system, right? And see how the seductive synthesis actually helps us um, generate these programs, right? As a reminder, the main idea behind seductive synthesis is that we will um, to find the program we will look for the proof right or or in other words uh, we will use the specification to guide the search uh, for the program right and what this means more specifically is that um, kind of the name of the game is to define a proof what's called a proof system and i will uh, tell you in a second what it means for deriving programs from specification so first Today I'll show you this proof system, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how the, the more complicated programs with recursion um, are handled by this proof system. And then at the end, I want to show you something cool uh, from our recent work: how we can discover recursive auxiliary functions. All right. So, like I said, the name of the game is to define a proof system that can um, uh, that shows you how to derive a program uh, from specification. And so what is a proof system? Well, proof systems is a bunch of rules, right? And in our case, this rules would look like this. If I have a precondition P and a postcondition Q, what kind of program should I derive to go from P to Q, basically, right? Um, and so, so most specifically, uh, when I have this, so this is also, remember we're talking about judgments or triples when I was talking about separation logic. This is also basically the same kind of triple, except instead of putting C in between P and Q, we kind of put it on the right to signal that well, this, this C is the output of our generation process, right, rather than being given. So uh, what this judgment um, uh, means is a state that satisfies P can be transformed into a state that satisfies Q, uh, using a program C, right? And the program C is not unique, of course, right? If it were unique, then we wouldn't have to search in the space of proofs. We would just, you know, go along the sort of same one path and, and be done with it. Um, but hopefully this, these rules will restrict the kinds of Cs we should look at sufficiently so that we don't have to do too much search. All right, so let me show you some examples uh, so, and by the way, the, the set of rules that we came up with for deriving programs from specifications, we call it synthetic separation logic, basically to mean it's a separation logic that is meant for synthesis, right? Okay, so let me uh, show you some example rules of synthetic separation logic to give you a flavor um, of what they look like. So uh, maybe you will help me guess what this rule should be, right? So our, our very first and simplest rule is the, it's the axiom of synthetic separation logic. Uh, looks like this. If your precondition is M, the empty heap, and your postcondition is the empty heap, what is the program? Maybe you can help me. What is the program um, that will bring us from the empty heap to the empty heap? The empty program will skip, right? We don't need to do anything, right? So, because, uh, you know, our uh, heap is already the same in the pre and post condition, so we can just skip. Okay, so this rule is called M, it's our axiom. All right, something a little bit more interesting. Um, so if we have in our pre and post condition, we have um, the same spatial assertion R, meaning the same part of the heap appears in the pre and post condition, right? We don't immediately know uh, what program we need to solve this. However, we know that we can simplify the specification, right? The way we can simplify it is if we can solve the problem, you know, uh, find the program C that goes from P to Q, right? Then we know that the same program would solve our original more complex specification. And so this is a little bit uh, subtle, right? Because how do you know that the program C doesn't change anything that R is talking about, right? So if it did, then uh, you know you could solve the, the, the specification on top, but not on the bottom. However, because you're in separation logic, 
C is only allowed to touch the part of the heap that P is talking about, right? And it's not allowed to touch R because R is known to be separate from P, right? So that's why this, this holds, this rule is sound. Um, and this is called the frame rule of synthetic separation logic. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, this is like out of scope, but like yesterday we had like the, you could sort of say like X2, which is sort of like you could free two things, but then we had a separating conjunction and another thing that referred to X. And I guess that doesn't like quite feel separate to me, but I don't know if that makes sense. I think I see what you're asking. You're asking about the block assertion, right? So um, basically, we're saying that there's a block at X and also uh, X points to something, right? And so uh, I mean, you you should you shouldn't think of this block assertion as describing this block of memory. You should think of it as um, the metadata of the memory allocator. It's basically like this little thing that you write in front of your memory block when you allocate it that allows you to deallocate the memory. This is a really good question, and you know many people ask that. Um, yeah, so it doesn't represent this whole memory. Make sense? All right, so another rule of separation logic, uh, of synthetic separation logic, is if in the post condition we have this x points to E, uh, heatland, and E is some program level non ghost expression, right? And then in the pre condition, uh, the, the location x is still there, right? We, and it points to something that we don't care about, right? So, how can we make this happen? What kind of program can we generate to make x point to E? Assignment or write, right? So, so we can write uh, e to x, right? But then, of course, we still need to go from p to q also, right? So uh, we will follow that up with some other program C. And so we basically say that, so um, if you see here on top, right? So all these rules, except for axioms, they have, you know, this horizontal line, right? And the thing, um, um, uh, Above the line is called antecedent, right? And the thing after the line is called consequent. So uh, basically, the idea is, you know, if you could prove the antecedent, then you can also prove the consequent, right? So, or in other uh, other words, you're usually constructing these proofs, um, you know, starting from the top level goal, and you kind of go up, right? And so, in another way to understand it, in order to prove the consequent, one way to do that is to just prove the consequent, right? So here in the antecedent, we still left, you know, x points to e and x points to e in both pre and post condition, uh, and we could have just removed them. This would also be another rule, but we're sort of trying to make it more modular, and we're going to say, well, the frame rule will then uh, can then uh, eliminate both of those uh, keywords and both that. So this is called the right rule, and then the final basic rule of SSL is the read rule. So the read rule says even the precondition. We have a uh, points to heat that, but points to a ghost variable, right? Ghost variable A. What we can do is we can read the ghost variable out into a fresh variable Y, right? And how this will how will this transform our specification? Well, if you look at the antecedent, we are replacing every occurrence of A with this Y, right? So now um, so you might think, well, in the previous rules that I showed you, the rule was simplifying the spec somehow, right? Making it smaller. Here it's not really making it smaller, it's just replacing one variable with another. Like, how is that? How does that help, right? Well, in fact, the fewer ghost variables we have in the spec, the better, right? Because we can do more things with program variables than with ghost variables. In particular, in particular, um, if we have so you know, if we have program variables on the right hand side of a points to, we can write. We can it enables the right rule, right? Um, so that's why this is not maybe uh, simplifying uh, the specification in the small, most direct sense, but it is making progress towards solving the problem because it's enabling other rule. Okay, and so these are the four basic rules of. As a cell, you might think that, oh, these rules are super simple, and that's true, but even those four are sufficient to derive our, uh, our global program, which was swap. Remember swap to variables? So remember, this is what our swap example looked like, right? X points to A, Y points to B, where A and B are ghosts, right? And we want uh, to swap them so that X points to B and Y points to A. Well, um, 
Of the four rules that I showed you now, which one would you say applies here? Remember, it was M, frame, read, and write. Does M apply? Not at all, because our key is not M. Um, does frame apply? No, because nothing is the same on both sides. Does write apply? No, the, so this is more, more interesting. The write does not apply because we don't, because everything in the post condition is X points to some ghost, right? So we cannot write B into S, for example, because B is not something that's in our program yet. It's a ghost variable. So the only one that applies is read, right? So uh, for example, we can read from X. Um, and uh, this will change our specification in this way. Now X points to A1, which is a program variable. We can read from Y as well. Um, and so now both X and Y point to some program variables. Uh, so because of that, we can now apply right because on, in the post condition, they also both point to the program variables, right? Uh, so we can apply, apply right to this uh, keyplet, um, and this will make the keyplets in the pre and post condition the same, right? So now we can apply frame to these two keyplets that became the same. Um, and uh, we can do the same with y, so apply right first and then frame. And so now we are in a situation where we have M to M, uh, where we can apply our axiom um, and uh, we emit skip, apply the M rule, and now our proof is complete, right? So, so you can see if you've never seen formal proofs before, um, they start with some goal that you want to prove, right? And then you build up your proof using your inference rules, right? Uh, kind of going from uh, constant to antecedent until you can apply something like an axiom, which does not have an antecedent, so then you're done. Right? And then we just have to collect all these pieces of the program that we admitted, and this is what we can apply. Okay, so let's see how this actually works in our web interface. That's the integration that I just did. Um, because later I will ask you to do these derivations by right hand. So you will play the synthesizer. So this is our swap example from before, except now I, uh, so I wanna switch it to manual mode and I wanna switch it from traditional to simplified. So what traditional does is like, traditional has all these optimizations that actually make this thing kind of hard to do by hand and simplified doesn't have the optimization. So it wouldn't work very well in automatic mode. It would just explode, right? But from doing this manually, it's kind of just more intuitive. So when I ask you to do the exercises, you should also do that um, switch to manual and to simplify. Um, so now we, we see our uh, pre and post condition here. So as you can see, uh, variables X and Y are green which means that the program variables, right? A and B are gray, is a ghost. Because ghosts are gray, we all know that. <laughs> um, okay, so now to actually see which rules apply, which rules are available, right? Um, we can click on the goal. So here it's actually a, a rule that I have not shown you, but it's just an auxiliary rule that basically says, um, if you have something on the left-hand side of the points to, then this thing cannot be a null pointer. Sometimes you need to extract that information to be able to prove something. So whenever you see this mill model, the wall, just ignore it. It's basically just add something to your uh, pure pre-condition or post-condition. Okay, so uh, now the only thing that was applicable from here was read from X, right? So, and, and you might ask, you know, why didn't I allow reading both from either from X or from Y? So this is basically one of the very important optimizations that our, our proof search has, which is some of the rules are so-called invertible, which means if you apply this rule, uh, it cannot be worse than not applying it. And then that allows you to apply this rule eagerly. So with read, for example, right, you can always read from this variable, nothing will get worse. From that, right, you will not disable any future rule applications. If you didn't need those reads, you can just clear them out later, right? Just remove the reads of variables that they want to use, right? Um, so that's why there's only one choice here, and then the other read is also the only choice we have. But at this point, um, you will have, well, actually, also only one choice. Uh, so at this point, um, again, so we're only offering one of the rights because it the system knows that it doesn't matter which one they do, and so um, it only offers one. But so 
at this point, uh, we have written into X, right? So now X stores V1 in both pre and post condition, right? So at this point, we can either frame out the X, right? These two are the same, or we can write into Y. That's also a valid option, right? And so here you can pick whichever one. So for example, if I pick the frame, then I can do the other right, and then I can do the other frame, and then everything turns green because we finished the derivation. And um, so this is a Correct for that. Uh, I could, this, in this case, I could also pick the other branch. This would also succeed, right? Because I could first do both of the rights and then do both of the frames. You know, nothing bad will happen. Um, so this will also turn green. Okay, this is how you can explore um, these derivations. And basically, the way system works is, um, you know, it explores those derivations automatically, right? It does some kind of best for search where it assigns some cost to those goals depending on how complex they are, it thinks they are to prove and it has like a big uh, work queue and picks goals and tries to solve them. Right? Nothing really fancy like that. Plus it has a lot of these optimizations that say, you know, these two you shouldn't try at the same time or like these are invertible and so um, you don't have to backtrack, right? Okay, so um, apart from these four rules that are very basic, right, and just like you read and write from things, we need a couple more rules to do uh, other operations. So, for example, if we want to deal with dynamic memory, we need rules for freeing and allocating this memory. And I will show you in uh, them in action, basically, but free uh, frees a block of memory that you have in the precondition. Uh, alloc allocates a memory block if you need one in the post condition. It wouldn't just do it really nearly out of nowhere, right? So that you avoid programs like, oh, let's allocate something and we, again, yeah, that's, you know, easy. Um, then when you have, remember inductive predicates, like lists of stuff, right? So you need to be able un to unfold definitions of those predicates. And so this is done with rules open and close. Open unfolds the definition in the precondition and close in the post condition. Um, and then you also need rules to deal with existentials. Remember, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you an example to to, um, to see what these existentials are and why they're hard to deal with. But basically, the idea is if in the post condition you say I need some value that satisfies some property, the synthesizer has to decide well which value is it, right? And it's not always that any value would do, would do right? Because it needs to satisfy some property, and the synthesizer is too big for it. Can you have some rules for that? Okay, so um, just to demo all these uh, different rules on a very simple example, right? So let me introduce this example of a bank account. So uh, this is not an inductive predicate. This predicate only has one, um, uh, so one case, right? And it doesn't have a recursive definition. So we just say we just say that the bank account at location X with a balance val, right? Is uh, is a is a memory block of size one, which simply has x points to val. is is just a, a reference to to the val value basically, right? Uh, but we also have a pure precondition that was well, sort of pure invariant in this case that the balance has to be non-negative, right? Okay, and let's say we want to synthesize uh, first the delete procedure, right? That deallocates a bank account. Um, and then we also want to synthesize a create that creates a new bank account with balance zero, right? So let me show you how to do those two, and then I'll let you do uh, another operation on bank accounts, okay? Um, okay, so let's first dispose bank account. So here the precondition is that we have an account at act with some balance A that we don't know, right? And then the post condition is M. So, um, let me click on this. The only thing that SUSLIC allows you to do here is open. Open means unfold the definition in the precondition, right? So then instead of this account predicate, we get its definition. We say, we know that now we have a block at A, right? And then it stores A. And we also learn that this A is non negative. Not super important here, but it might be important at some other Okay, so now this, this new model of all rule that is um, already told you about. So we, we read just in case. Okay, and so after reading, basically the only thing that we can do here is free because we have this block of memory, right? Um, 
We have nothing in the both conditions, so there's nothing related to the right? So uh, up to be free, we get M and M, right? Um, and so we can just do the M rule and the gum. So this is again this super simple. This was just to illustrate uh, the open rule. Okay, but now let's do something a little bit more interesting, which is create a bank account, right? Uh, create a bank account um, and store it at a location rent, right? So remember, because SUSE cannot, doesn't have a return statement, you have to pass it a location where the new bank account should be stored, right? Um, and we want its balance to be zero. So if you look at the, uh, at the goal here, so this is where those existentials that I was talking about show up, right? So for example, here, the location of the new bank account is an existential, like we don't really know where to put the bank account. Uh, here, it turns out to be not a problem because, you know, there are no constraints on that, right? So wherever Malik happens to put it is going to be fine, right? But in general, there could be constraints. Okay, so um, again, you know, the model applies. But now, so at this point, um, so here in the precondition, we have return points to zero, right? Here we have return points to add and account, right? So what are the, we have multiple options. Those are actually quite interesting, right? So one thing we could do is close, which means I'll unfold this definition. And this is, spoiler alert, this is what we should do, right? Because we should look at what account, what an account is. We will know that it's a, a block of memory and then we can allocate, right? But another option, for example, is, uh, what's called unify, right? So why is Susan suggesting unify? Well, because it has this, you know, in the post condition, red points to some act. It doesn't know what it is, right? In the precondition, red points to zero. Uh, well, it thinks that, well, maybe act is zero, right? Because then if I make act be zero, which I can because it's an existential, I don't know what it is, right? Then I could just frame out those two, right? And that would be that. So it will simplify the specification, right? Let's let's see what happens if we do that, right? Um, so if we do that, then we could um, we could frame, right? So if we frame, we end up with you know m to the precondition and then account zero zero, right? So it's an account that starts at the null point because we unify that with with zero, right? Um, and so what can we do from here? Well, the only thing we, we still have to do, can do this close, right? Which is uh, unfold this definition. And so if we unfold this definition, we get this weird points to which says null pointer points to one points to zero. But this of course is not great because null pointer doesn't point. Um, and so here, this rule nil null val will actually add something to our pure post condition, which says, well, if if now points to something, it means it cannot be null, right? So we get this inconsistent post condition, and then immediately SUSE so detects that post condition is inconsistent. So this is a dead end. Yeah, I can click on it as much as I want, so I can go into it. Okay. So this is where, if we were an automatic search, we would need to backtrack, right? So let's backtrack. And so instead of doing this unify that was silly, um, uh, we will click on close from the beginning, right? Uh, which will unfold this. Uh, and so from here on, we can also do unify. We don't want to do that, right? So instead of doing unify, what we actually want to do is alloc, right? So we want to allocate this memory block in the precondition so that we then later can unify with, with the post condition again. Uh, get rid of it. So as you can see now, in the be, before we did our lock, right, our precondition didn't have anything. It had M, right? So, uh, so rather it had red points to zero, but nothing else for that. Um, whereas if we do a lock, then uh, apart from this, what we get is a memory block and some fresh variable, right? Because malloc puts its memory wherever it wants, not where you tell it to, right? Um, and then um, this memory block, this, this memory location just stores some random value, right? In this case, six. <laughs> because why not? <laughs> um, so at this point, um, at this point, we can actually frame out the um, frame on the block, right? So we have the same block of memory in both. And so once we frame out the block, we can write, right? Because 
we want red, the red to point to F1, um, whereas in the precondition it's zero, so we can write into it, then we can frame it out. And finally, we can write into F, right? Because we want F1 to be zero, whereas our F1 is the frame of value. So we can write into F, and then again, we can frame, and we're done, right? An interesting thing also that to, to point out here is that um, in order to complete this proof, we also have to prove that uh, our balance in the account that we're creating is non negative. And it happened to be true because we were creating a good balance zero, right? If I put in my spec um, instead of account at zero, if I put minus one here, right, I, I would very quickly my proof will fail because I won't be able to create it. Okay, so at this point, an exercise for you. Um, with the same bank account data structure, implement a deposit. Uh, and by implement, I mean write the spec and then do this derivation step by step. Um, so you would go to, if you don't remember where the interface is, you go to github.com slash titus slash social tutorial. And then you click on um, account deposit. And so here to do one is to write a precondition that says you have an account at, uh, at act, right? And then the post condition says I have the, the same account, but with a modified balance, you're supposed to increase by this amount, right? That you get as, a, as a, uh, an argument. And then in step three, you should derive it manually, interactively, uh, like I just demonstrated. Um, and so re re recall that for that, you should switch the demo to manual and the body. And please raise your hand. Second proofs are sort of more flexible in that they allow you to not posit deduction hypothesis a priori, but to find one somewhere inside your derivation. And we will see uh, in a minute how this will actually allow us to do fancier things, for example, generate um, recursive auxiliaries. In this case, we are not doing anything fancy. We are, we are still generating a simple self recursive program because we are using the root of our derivation anyway as the compare. Right. So if we were doing regular proof by induction, we would generate an active hypothesis from that proof anyway. Right. So um, this is how they are connected. Um, so basically, in, in the context of synthesis, forming a backlink in your derivation is what it does in terms of synthesizing a program. It synthesizes the reverse of all. Right. But um, I kind of penetrated a little bit. But uh, kind of the, the interesting part, though, is what should be the arguments? To this recursive form, right? Because here I said, oh, these two both look similar, but what does similar mean, right? They're not the same. Uh, if you see that, uh, if you notice this one is X as the argument to list, and that one is Y as the argument to list, right? And so intuitively, what that would mean is, well, I probably should co dispose with Y, right? Because I'm using Y instead of X in the predicate, right? But how do we automate and formalize this reasoning of like how to come up with this argument, right? And so in SUSIC, this is done with this um, process called call abduction. So what call abduction is, is basically when we see a goal like this, which we think we should try to backlink to something, but we are not, but it's not exactly the same yet, right? We, we are entering this, um, this special mode of proof generation that is called call abduction, in which our goal uh, has a different shape. We are basically saying, we are currently in the state with or Y. We are trying to make a call to dispose with some existential X prime, which we don't know what it is, right? So in order to do that, we need to arrive in the state with or X prime. Once we do the call, we will get M back, you know, and from that state, we will have to still go to the final state that we want, which in this case is M. So the second part of this complicated goal is trivial in this case, right? But the first part is not as trivial because we have to somehow go from this of y to this of x prime, right? And so uh, we treat this goal as like a normal synthesis goal basically, right? So as if, as if this, this x prime were a post condition, 
right? And so to solve this goal, we need to unify, which is something that solves the existential by making it equal to something that we have the three dimensions, right? So now if we unify x prime with y, that's how we learn that this goal should be called with y, right? And so now we can use frame on that first tableau to get m to f. So now we are done with pole abduction. When you're done with pole abduction, you use the pole rule to like exit the pole abduction mode, right? And so now um, you basically just have whatever is happening after the pole, which in this case is m to m, which we can just apply the Okay. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to show you that this same relation in, um, in the web linker case, but I think in the interest of time, I will skip this demo and I will also skip this exercise. So in this exercise, I wanted to ask you to derive that uh, says uh, single to double the interest in place that we have um, uh, done on, on Monday automatically. So this would be your whole work. This is a harder exercise. If you want to practice more, you can do this this um, at home. Um, and instead, in the interest of time, I'll move to this very last thing, this cool thing that I want to show you, which is how we can use cyclic proofs to derive um, recursive auxiliary. Okay. Okay, so now, uh, sort of a similar problem to our single to double link list, except a little bit more complicated. We have a binary tree, and we want to convert it to a double link list to battle it. But in place, right? And this is actually, you know, can be done in place because you can see that the node of a binary tree, it has the same shape as the node of double inverse, right? They both have a payload and two pointers. So we just want to like traverse this tree and switch the pointers around and get the double inverse out of it, right? So, and, um, and so this is, uh, fairly straightforward to specify in so that, right? So you can say I have a tree at pointer x with elements s, right? And in the end, I have doubling place at the same pointer x. Um, you know, the back pointer doesn't matter, and the, the set of elements is the same, right? And in fact, this task is uh, you might be surprised because it looks just like this other task that we just done, right? But in fact, it's quite a bit more challenging. And um, in fact, if you give this, you know, this kind of task to a whole bunch of other deductive uh, synthesizers, including the first version of Suzuki from 2019, they won't be able to solve this task, right? So what's up with that? You know, why is this task more complicated? And it turns out that solving this task requires discovering recursive auxiliaries. So let me give you uh, an illustration for why this is happening. So let's say we are now synthesizing this flatten, right? And now I replace the bridge model formulas with pictures just so that it's easier to follow. The triangle is a, is a tree and the, uh, whatever, rectangle, <laughs> long rectangle uh, is a double twist, right? So what our synthesizer could do with this problem, right? Is, well, it could open um, the tree, right? And so if the tree is empty, then this is a trivial problem. But so let's focus on the case where the tree is not empty, right? So the tree is not empty, it means it has a root x and it has the left and the right subject. Right? Um, so now uh, the tool can very easily recurse, make a recursive call on the left subtree, right? This will look like this, the tree turns into a list. Uh, then we can make a call on the right subtree, the right subtree turns into a list, but now we're stuck. Why we stop is because in the precondition we have two lists, in the postcondition we have one list, which means we have to, we need to somehow merge two lists into one, right? So we kind of need something like an append um, procedure, right? But this by itself is a recursive function. We cannot just do it without extra recursion or one on two, right? And that's why these other tools that are only able to generate um, Recur like self recurse functions get stuck, right? However, with cyclic groups, we can actually solve this. So, how would we solve this? And um, so, let's say we start exactly the same way as I just showed you, you know, uh, a tool would start, and we arrive at this goal, which I said that, you know, the original suspect or these other tools would not be able to solve this intermediate goal. 
And let's give this all a name, uh, just for future reference, let's call it G. Okay. So how would Susan proceed to solve G? Well, I mean, uh, you can proceed just like it normally would. So for example, we have two lists here. Why don't we open one of them? So let's say we open list L, right? And so if we open list L, now we have uh, the head of list L, and then the tail of list L, and let's say that's pointed to by pointer N, right? And now we see that this goal kind of looks familiar, right? So this goal also has uh, two input lists and one output list, right? And, you know, some elements hanging, hanging in there, right? Um, and it looks just like the goal G from before, except that one of these input lists is smaller, right? Because this N is the tail of the original list L, right? And so because of that, we can actually use cycle proofs to link back to, but this time we are not linking back to the root of the derivation, but we are linking back to the intermediate goal G, right? So what does it mean? So remember when we're linking back to the root, this generates the reversal call, right? So here, this is not a reversal call to plasma. Instead, it's a call to some cover function. So it's called a cover, right? Whose arguments are all of these variables that we have now in in in, okay, in the spec. And so we don't know what this helper function does, except that we do know because its set is G, right? So we know that helper basically takes into a list L and R and takes an element and then it concatenates them all together, right? And so when we're calling helper and RL, what this will do, right? It will put you know all these three together in a single list. And so after the call to helper ends, we have we have this state, right? And then this goal is very simple to solve because we have one list in the precondition, one list in the post condition. We just have to close that, that other list. And so now everything is solved, right? But we have a very weird program. So we have this program Platinum that calls some helper that does not exist, right? Um, however, we know what this helper is, right? Helper is um, a function whose spec is the goal G and whose body, hence, is the code that we generated from G, right? So let's take all that code that we generated from G and then we, fa and then we factor it out into this helper function, okay? And now we have this helper function that has a body, it is recursive, right? Um, and we have a spec for it too, right? Because that's G. And so now we're done. So now we have synthesized the three flattening thing with two recursive procedures, right? Latin and helper, for which we also have the space. So this is another instantiation of this adaptive synthesis idea where you look at the spec um, to help you find the program, right? So here, instead of looking for all possible recursive procedures with all possible specifications that you have, right? Instead, we were just like going down our derivation and we saw like, oh, if only you could have this procedure, we could complete the proof, right? And then we just abduce this procedure basically. Um, I just wanted to show you that this actually works. Obviously, I need to put it in traditional. And run, so this takes a little longer. But takes about 20 seconds. Yeah. So as you can see, it generated the slatin, right? That first calls slatin on the left and the right. Um, and then it called, calls this mysterious slatin 118, right? And the plan 118, if you look closely to it, it, it does what I said it does. It concatenates. Uh, the two lists L and R and an extra element X. Um, yeah. Um, all right. I know that I should. So we we should be wrapping up, right? And um, so yeah. So I had another exercise for you that again, unfortunately, we don't have to do now, but you can do in the break. Um, so another cool thing that you can do with these side proofs is to generate. Um, 
functions that manipulate usually recursive data structures. Okay, so an example of a usually recursive data structure is what's called a rose tree. A rose tree is a, a variable energy tree that is defined as um, uh, you know every tree node has a linked list of children. Right, so it's defined as two mutually recursive predicates. Right, a rose tree depends on, on linked list, and the linked list has rose trees inside. Um, so this is kind of the picture of how it looks. Right, so this orange tree, the a rose tree nodes, orange nodes, sorry, and the green trees are linked list nodes. Um, and so, for example, you can use SOSA to generate a procedure that deallocates a rose tree. Right, um, and this, of course, this procedure will have two mutually recursive. Uh, procedures, right? So, procedure called delegating the rose tree will call something to delegate the list of children, which will call back to the, to the main rose tree procedure. And so, for this exercise, this one I don't think is, is very complicated. If you want to do it, well, if you want to do it automatically, then you don't have to do anything. You just click on it and it, it just does it, right? So, as you can see, um, this dispose calls dispose 10, right? But dispose 10 itself calls calls dispose and, and dispose 10. Um, and the, 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 the point of the exercise was that you can also try to derive that manually to see how. Um, so here, kind of challenge will be that you will need to use that call abduction rule, this try call, right? And there will be multiple options for which one to use, and you would have to, you know, kind of pick the right one. Um, but yeah, otherwise, that's it. And I wanted to show you. There's some papers that you can read, but most importantly, my wonderful collaborators, um, Ilya and I started this project in 2019. The heart have um, prepared this demo and do many other things. So uh, thanks to all the people and thanks to you for listening. Thank you.